Welcome to the RE Podcast, the first dedicated RE podcast for students and teachers. My name is Louisa Jane Smith and this is the RE Podcast in a special collaboration with Ashish Kundi on the decolonisation of RE. You might remember Ash as he was a guest on a previous episode. Ash is head of RE in Yorkshire. He's also the founder of Teacher Consciousness, a movement based on a belief of equity and authenticity in the curriculum. We mentioned in our episode before that we would collaborate to create a special series of podcasts looking at the decolonisation of RE, and now that is being made a reality. So Ash, just remind us of what decolonisation means in terms of our curriculum. Firstly, hi, everyone. Really glad to see everyone here. And also, well, just to clarify what decolonization is, it's about increasing the authenticity of how we learn, for example, about very particular communities. And it's more than purely just increasing diversity as well. Whilst that is a slight angle on it, it's more than just increasing the diversity that we look at things. And it's about teaching subject knowledge as it is, rather than what we think it is, and often challenging the colonial lens that will often portray many of our curriculum areas with as well. So it's about challenging the colonial lens and making sure that we're being as authentic as possible in our delivery of subject content as we move forward, hopefully, as we're developing further. And Ash, do you want to just introduce our guest for today's episode? That's fine, yeah. So just G, I've been really lucky to be lectured by Just G during my early uni days as well. He's so full of charisma, really enthusiastic lecturer, and has inspired me to go on and teach as well. He's an associate professor at the University of Leeds, and he's got a wealth of knowledge that he can contribute towards what we're looking to do through this. So we're very lucky to have him this afternoon as well. So over to Just G, really, and I'll start with Louisa to give the first question. <laughs> thanks, Ash. <laughs> no pressure there. Thanks for the thanks for the kind words. <laughs> just G, can I just formally welcome you to the RE podcast? It's such an honour to have you, and thank you for giving up your time. But is there anything you would like to say in introduction of who you are? Sure. Yeah. So, as Ash just said, I'm Dr. Jasjit Singh. I'm based at the University of Leeds in the School of Philosophy, Religion, and the History of Science. My PhD was actually all about how emerging adults, eighteen to thirty year olds, Sikhs in Britain learn about the Sikh tradition. So I was looking at a lived religion lens and trying to understand how religion is transmitted from generation to generation and also between peers. So I did quite a lot of research at young Sikh events, youth Sikh events. I did some research in Gurdwaras and families and I basically looked at all the basic arenas of transmission, areas where people learn about religion and kind of try to understand how they interact with one another. And I published articles and chapters on the role of, for example, on the role of the internet on the role of camps, on the role of Sikh societies at universities and the like as well. So I'm not a theologian at all. I'm not an expert on the beliefs of various traditions, but I'm more a sociologist of religion, I'd kind of describe myself as. So what role does religion play in society? Excellent. Yeah, that's the question I'm most interested in. I think that's a really good one to move forward with as well, because it's given the angle to it, because that's often how Ari is taught about its approach and how we can learn from the subject. And how when when we look at RS, the impact that it has on people's lives, actually that angle is really, really important. And then I think something to start off with would be when talking about Sikhi in the classroom for some of our RS teachers out there or RE teachers out there, in terms of language, what is the most authentic language to be using when referring to Sikhi. So, for example, are there often misconceptions in the sense that people will use the wrong language basically when teaching about Sikhi or anything like that that you have picked up on in your experience? Yeah, so the very fact that you're using Sikhi and not Sikhism, I think, is really important. And it's a distinction that I always make. So I'm actually currently teaching a level two module on Sikhi at Leeds. And it's a distinction that's really important because Sikhism isn't a term really that Sikhs would generally use themselves unless they're talking to a non-Sikh. It's not a term that Sikhs would use when talking amongst themselves because it's not a Sikh term, you know. And also it's a noun, it's a thing, it's a thing that kind of gives an idea of something that's set in stone, a set of beliefs, a set of practices, you know, this is Sikhism, this is what it is, this is what it's always been. Whereas Sikhi is a verb and it's kind of loosely translates as learning to be human through lived experience. So it's all about living a life and learning about how to improve yourself through your life, through your experiences. So it isn't something that Sikhs follow Sikhism. So Sikhs follow this thing that's there and set in stone. It's lived practice. And I think the point of using terms that Sikhs themselves would use is really, really important. So Sikhi gives a different impression I think, and it presents the tradition in a different way to Sikhism. And also, the I mean, both terms, Sikhism and Sikhi, stem from the verb Sikhna in Punjabi, which means to learn. So both are about learning, 
But the noun Sikhism is a lot more static than the verb Sikhi, which is about learning through lived experience. That's the kind of key point I think that it's really important to make. So, I mean, the issue is, and I know it's quite, a, it's a big issue, and it's, a, it's an issue that I face in my writing as well, is that the term Sikhism has become so ingrained, like Hinduism isn't a term that many Hindus would use, and Buddhism and the like, you know, it's become so ingrained that it's kind of become the norm to describe this tradition. But that doesn't mean it's right, though. There's no reason why we can't start using more authentic terms when we talk about particular traditions. So that's the first thing, I think, in terms of authentic language. And then also another important term, for example, is gurmat, which means the mat or the thinking of the guru. And that's something that Sikhs would follow as well. So rather than using terms like beliefs, which again is more of a kind of rule-based this is what all these beliefs are. A way of thinking is something that's probably more important and more authentic to actually engage with. What kinds of thinking do the gurus talk about? And that's a lot more flexible because that means that Sikhs can engage with experiences in their lives in different ways. It's not always about going to this rule book that says you must do X, Y, Z, which is lots of religions are represented in this kind of way where it's all about, you know, there's all these rules that all these people have to follow. But it really isn't that. It's about what kind of sense of thought, what kind of approach does Sikhi give a Sikh to meet the challenges of day-to-day -day life, if that makes sense? So those two things, I think, in terms of authenticity are, it's a verb, it's lived experience, and it's about a way of thinking rather than a set of beliefs. That's really interesting that you mentioned that, because that's something that I was beginning to think when you were going through that. So you talk about gurma, you talk about this idea of learning from experience, and that actually it's moving away from just the idea of beliefs and the idea of following X, Y, and Z rule. But where do you think that kind of teaching and that lens has come from, from what you can think of? Where's the source of that? Yeah, whenever you look at trying to remove that, I think it's really important to tackle it at its root. Sure. So as you've already said, lots of this came from the colonial encounter, where basically lots of traditions in different parts of the world had to present themselves in a way that the colonial powers could understand. So they kind of reframed themselves into versions, or not versions of, but they could frame themselves to look like Christianity. And a consequence of this, for instance, is the Guru Granth Sahib, for example, which is often presented as a holy book, akin to the Bible. But anybody who studied Sikhi, anybody who's engaged with Sikhs, anybody who knows anything about Sikh institutions will know that the Guru is much more than a holy book. I mean, there's a number of reasons, you know, it's seen as being the embodied light of the Ten Gurus. It's seen, regarded as a living being. The fact that Sikhs can get teachings from the Guru Granth Sahib every day in the form of a Hukam Nama, in the, in the form of a daily reading. The fact that the place of worship, and again, I don't think that's the right term either, but a Gurdwara is only a Gurdwara because of the Guru Granth Sahib. So a Gurdwara isn't just a place of worship, it's a place of engagement with the Guru, the Guru Granth Sahib and the teachings, and the Sangat, which is the congregation. So it's all these kinds of things. And again, that's all about lived experience. It's about, and an important point to make there, I think, is that even though the Guru Granth Sahib is often described as a holy book, it isn't the same as many other holy texts in that it isn't a history of Sikhism. It isn't a history of Sikhi. It isn't about Gunalik woke up one morning and did this, blah, 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 blah. It's a compilation of compositions in poetic form about the human condition. So it's about what does it mean to be human? How should you tackle whatever life throws at you? It isn't a story of the Guru. So it's very different to other texts, I'd argue. And the fact that Sikhs have a clear lineage back to the writings of Guru Nanak, so we know that Guru Nanak wrote their writings in a book and that was passed down to the next guru, passed down to the next guru. So there's a clear lineage of where these writings actually came from. So these are the actual writings of the gurus which Sikhs engage with when they read and sing from the Guru Granth Sahib. So that's really, really important. And as I think calling the Guru Granth Sahib a holy book, you just lose all this context and all this detail it's framed as another holy book. So this lens that we're talking about has come from this encounter where Sikhs at the time felt the need to frame Sikhi with a priesthood, for instance. You know, there isn't a formal priesthood in Sikhi. Anybody can be a Sikh. There's no kind of hierarchy authority in that kind of way. I think a place of worship diminishes the role of the Gudra because the fact that, for example, you have Langar there, the fact that there's a community kitchen, it isn't just for worship. It isn't just for individual worship. It's for bringing the community together. So it plays much more of a societal role as well as a religious role. And I think, sorry if I'm going on, but I think a lot of this also comes down from this distinction that's made between the religious and the secular. They're often described as two separate spheres, but that doesn't really exist in Sikhi. Every single Sikh concept, Miri, Piri, Lunga, Sangat, Bangat, every single Sikh concept has a, quote, spiritual and a societal aspect to it. So there isn't a distinct separation between the religious only happens on a Sunday, blah, 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 
and the secular. They are both completely ingrained. Mm. There's no point being religious if you're not making a difference to the world. And if you're trying to make a difference to the world, you need to do it according to a moral framework. They both talk to one another, basically. I think that's amazing. I think as an RE teacher, the five things that I've picked up that are just so simple that we can make dramatic changes from this point on is one, just using the word sicky, just introducing that into our vernacular is easy. Using the word gunma instead of teaching and then not representing the Guru Granth Sib as a book, not looking at the Gurdwara as a place of worship and also not distinguishing between the spiritual and the secular. They're just five very simple things that if we can just very slightly adjust our thinking, we can make RE much more authentic. That's so wonderful. One question I'd love to ask you, Jasjeed, and listening to what you're saying, I think I almost know the answer to this, is what do you love most about Sikhi? If there was one thing that you'd want us to sort of embed in our students as we're teaching this, what would that be? Sort of alluded to it already, is this whole kind of the practical aspect of it, the fact that it isn't just something that you do in your head on a Sunday or it isn't about the individual. It's about the collective. It's all about the collective. And that stems from the whole idea of Ikungar, you know, the thing that starts the Guru Granth Sahib, the whole idea. And that's interesting as well. The fact that Ikungar is often translated as, you know, there is one God. Whereas personally, I think a more authentic translation would be everything is one, which both mean very different things because the idea of there is one God means that there's something in the sky that's separate from creation. Whereas everything is one means that we're all kind of linked. Everything's linked together. And You'll find a lot of sick ethics and a lot of sick practice comes from this idea that everything is one. So, for instance, you may have seen Sikh food banks, for instance, and Sikh charities. And recently, when um, I think it was December, when there were the lorries in Kent and Sikh charities went to help out, all stems from this idea that everything is one. And so what inspires me from Sikhi is the fact that it has to be a practical implementation of these teachings. It isn't just about you gaining salvation for yourself, because if you've just done that for yourself, then what good is that to anybody else? And I think, mm. you know, anyone that's taught Sikhi, that's what inspires us about this. These wonderful, selfless group of people that are outward looking and that work in the community and where they see a need. But also, and something that you've alluded to before, is knowledge and knowing and experiencing and questioning and not just accepting. I think that's a challenge for all of us. Ash? Something that's always stuck with me with a lot of communities is its representation in the media, which I think is really important. I just think about my own experiences growing up as Sanatan or Hindu in, in the UK, where mm. growing up and watching something like Indiana Jones, and that was your representation, effectively, Temple of Doom. Mm. And I think the reason I kind of mm. related to this to a degree is that you talk about the societal structures, being yeah. Hindu Punjabi as well, was that I saw someone who was, and I used, make it really clear, inverted commas, sick in the Temple of Doom, and he's there, got, and he's got, and he's on the bad side, and all the rest of it. And he's there trying to stop the doctor from escaping and things like that. And I just felt, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know the guy I'm talking about. Yeah, so <laughs> I'm there thinking. Yeah. After Indiana Jones the Temple of Doom came out, I was asked about whether we eat monkey brains, wasn't it, or something? Yeah, I think. Yeah. So yeah, yeah and I was like, this really I feels wrong. Us, yeah. <laughs> and I was just thinking, like, I just wanted to get your perspective on that, on the representation of six in the media, on the representation of the philosophy as well in the media, on the lifestyle. Is it fair? Is it as representative as it could be? What does it do right, do you think? And where's its areas of improvement from your perspective? Yeah, it's a really good question. It's actually a research interest of mine. I've kind of been looking at the ways in which Sikhs have been represented in media all the way back to the colonial period, actually. And it's really interesting because there's kind of this model minority framing of Sikhs and you'll often see lots of discussions. Well, not often, I suppose only very recently have you seen Sikhs talked about in relation to their, you know, sacrifices in the First World War, for example. But I've kind of analysed the way in which Sikhs have been represented in media over the last hundred years. And it's really interesting. So when they support the state, then they're represented as being good model minority people who fight for the country, blah, 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 fought in the First World War, fought in the Second World War. But when, for instance, they were agitating against the British colonial powers in the 1920s, they were represented as extremists. And then when they came to Britain in the 1960s and 70s, turban campaigns, again, they were represented negatively. There were lots of cartoons in papers kind of, you know, denigrating Sikhs. And then 84 happened as well. And then there was lots of, you know, representations of extremism then as well. And now, I mean, now it's really interesting because post 9-11, post 9-11 securitization and the post 9-11 kind of lens on visible minority communities, there's a lot more interest in what visible minorities do, I think, from the media, but not in a positive way. It's generally about what are these people up to? 
So at the moment, you get representations of Sikhs where they're helping people. So as long as they're doing good for other people, then they're represented positively in the media. But there's always a kind of suspicion about what Sikhs are up to as well. And I mean, it's interesting because I've delivered training to journalists as well. And you find that, and it's something about RE in general, is the fact that, and it's something I still can't get my head around, the fact that not every school covers the same topics in different parts of the country and different kinds of schools. And you think, you know, we live in an international society at the moment. Everybody should learn about everybody, I'd have thought. I teach undergraduate students in their first year. I always ask them the question, 85 students, I always ask them, how many of you have learned about Sikhi or Hinduism or Buddhism? And the numbers are really low. It's usually Christianity, Islam and Judaism. And some of them haven't covered anything else beyond that. And I don't think we're doing students a service by just limiting their RE experience to three traditions that are very similar. And this comes back to what I was talking about earlier in that studying Christianity, Islam and Judaism gives you a particular framing of what religion is, doesn't it? Because they come from the same kind of background, whereas Sikhi, Hinduism, Buddhism would give you a different kind of exposure to what religion quotes might be. So in terms of media representation, again, I think religious literacy as a whole is an issue, especially when journalism as a profession comes from a very specific kind of background. It isn't very diverse. We know that already. There's only certain kinds of people that can become journalists. So there's an organization called the Sikh Press Association that's been set up, which monitors representations of Sikhs and Sikhi. And there's one really interesting example which I'd like to share with you. So Vasaki is the most important festival in the Sikh calendar. Everyone knows about it. It happens in April. And clearly, somebody who came to Britain in the 70s or 80s framed Vasaki as the Sikh New Year, right? And if you go on the BBC website, it says Vasaki is a Sikh New Year, and the pages on the BBC website are archived, so they haven't been updated. But Vasaki is not actually the Sikh New Year. The Sikh New Year actually happens in March. It happens in a month called Chirth. It happens a month before Vasaki. Vasaki is important because it's the event, and you guys will know this, where Guru Gobind Singh created the Khalsa, gave the Sikhs their identity. So it's not the Sikh New Year. It's important because of the identity aspect of it. But because it's on this archived page of the BBC website, <laughs> media will still refer to it as the Sikh New Year. Now, what's interesting there is that, for me, is what becomes an authority on Sikhi? Is it the BBC website or is it the Sikh Press Association, for example, who is saying it's not the Sikh New Year, but that's kind of being ignored. So there's lots of interesting questions there about who becomes an authority and what kinds of sources are regarded as being legitimate and not. So for going forward, if anyone's teaching Vasaki, it is not the Sikh New Year. The Sikh New Year happens a month before in March. <laughs> but anyway, I'll stop there. Noted. Yeah. <laughs> and obviously, if anyone from the BBC is listening, please change your website. Or if anybody knows anyone that works for the BBC and has the power to change it, please do that. And that's a challenge for us, isn't it, as RE teachers of where we're getting our information from. Mm -hmm. You know, I know that there are a lot of RE teachers there that are teaching authentic Sikhism and there are teachers out there that are not necessarily teaching a completely authentic curriculum. And there are teachers there who are going to learn. What, from your point of view, Jasjeed, do we do right? Is there a way that we're teaching it or an information that we impart that we're getting right? Just to sort of encourage, yeah, yeah, yeah. encourage those no, no, teachers that are doing absolutely. a great job. No, no, absolutely. You know, and I've looked at the syllabi and everything. And I think the emphasis on virtues and ethics is really important. And what you said, Louisa, about, you know, the whole kind of practical aspects of it, you mentioned that yourself. And that's what people are talking about. That's really, really important. I think also the identity is very interesting, isn't it? So I look like this. And I think the way in which religious dress is framed is really, really important. So if it's just framed as something that people do because they're supposed to do it and it'll please God or whatever, then that's not the right way to frame it. So for instance, the turban as something that was seen as an act of resistance against the powers that be and the fact that only royalty could wear it and it was seen as something that emphasized equality. I think that sort of stuff's really important. So when I've engaged and I've done primary and secondary assemblies, there's definitely an awareness of, for example, of the 5Ks. There's definitely an awareness of some of the ethics. There's always an awareness that Sikhs generally don't proselytize. There's always this awareness that Sikhs say, be a good whatever you are. We're not out there to convert. So that's all good as well. So this virtues and ethics thing tends to come through quite strongly when I've engaged with RE lessons. And I think, Ash, if you don't mind, just because you've mentioned the 5Ks there, I think one question we did mm. want to ask you was how to teach more effectively about the Kapan mm. specifically of mm. the 5Ks. Yeah, it's a really interesting question, Louisa. Mm. Yeah, but just to give it a bit of context to that, because often we'll find that mm. with the Kapan, particularly for a non-specialist RE teacher in the schools, 
that will often be something where, look, I know the argument for, you know, freedom of religious expression, mm. but then my argument back stops there, <laughs> basically. Yeah. So it was like, what are the tools that you could provide, for, I suppose, in essence, for RE teachers in the schools to be able to have that discussion? I mean, it's a really interesting question. And I'll be completely frank in my comments about it. So firstly speaking, I know it's often presented as a symbol, but I think that does the Gurban disservice. I mean, let's be completely honest, it is a weapon. You can't say on the one hand that Sikhs condemn empty ritual, and on the other hand, say that they're wearing a symbol that's just there for symbolic reasons. It doesn't make any sense. So it is their weapon, but the point to understand is the context in which the weapon emerged. So it can only be used in defense or to protect others. And actually, this is really relevant to what's happening in the world today. The question to think about is what happens if a state goes wrong? Yeah. Or what happens yeah, if the powers that enforce the state's, you know, ideas mm. go wrong? So yeah. thinking about the Black Lives Matter movement, for instance, we've seen examples in recent weeks, in fact, of state apparatus acting immorally, right? So I think the Grabant can bring in a lots of interesting questions about the way the world works. If it's framed as being something that seeks where to protect others and to defend others in case they need to. And I've talked to Sikhs in the States about this as well, about uh, gun laws and everything and why the Gurban versus guns. And yesterday or the day before in Indianapolis in America, four Sikhs were shot and killed on a FedEx depot. And this has, again, raised lots of questions on Twitter about self-defense. And if you're going to use a Gurban, it's not something you can do from distance. It's not something you can do from miles away. And you can't kill lots of people with a Gurban. If you're going to engage with somebody one-to-one, -one, it's something you, that you'd have to do very close up. So it isn't like a gun. But the point about it is I think it's there to defend those who are defenseless or who need defending. Does that make sense? Does it make sense what I'm saying? Yeah, thanks. Mm. Yeah. I've thought about it quite a bit, actually, because you're right. Otherwise, it's just presented as, yeah, it's a symbol that Sikhs wear. I know an important point to make is it's only Amrit Dari Sikhs that can wear one as well. And I think Sikhs need to do a better job of this as well. Is you would have to undergo some sufficient training to be able to wear one or at least be qualified to wear one. So it isn't all Sikhs. It's only those who've undertaken initiation or who've become Amradari who've taken a pledge to become Karl Sussex in the first place. And then it comes with all this kind of understanding about the context in which it emerged. So it emerged in a context where the state could go wrong. I think that conversation is still relevant today. I think something to add on to that as well, which you've touched on, this mm. idea of what if the state goes wrong. Clearly throughout Sikh history, there's been cases where the state went wrong mm. and then Sikhs have had to stand up in order to defend people. Mm and defend many communities. And the thing is, is that if you were to misuse, because there's always this argument, well, you know, if, if somebody was to misuse it and things like that, but there is the weight of all that history yeah. to be a completely contradicting if you were to misuse it. And do you want to be the person that is contradicting that history? I mean, I know I wouldn't want to be. <laughs> I, I wouldn't want to be that guy that's completely contradicting all of that rich history that goes behind, for example, the Banjikaki as well, 5Ks, it's all there. So yeah, that context is really important. I'm glad you've mentioned that because... There haven't been that many examples of the Graban being misused versus gun laws. I mean, there was something on Twitter this week of the number of shootings last week in America. Do you know what I mean? Mm. So it's interesting, isn't it? I think there's a whole series of, especially secondary schools, there's a whole series of discussions that could kind of come off the discussion about the Graban, mm. the context, the state, and why Sikhs would wear it. Yeah. When you mentioned things from the shooting that mm. happened quite recently in America as well, and the media and portrayal of certain things as well, like, the portrayal of the Gurban in the media is unfortunately not always positive. Can to go back to that previous question on the media? The impact on six in the UK or globally, from what you can see, what is the impact on six globally, I suppose, from your experience of this misrepresentation of things like the Gurban and the things that you mentioned earlier as well, so on the day-to-day -day life for six? There was a case last week of a Sikh lawyer or barrister not being allowed into court because they were wearing a Gurban and they're on Madari. I think it's this kind of gaze of suspicion, isn't it? It's this gaze of suspicion which has become a lot worse since 9-11 and since securitization has come into play. But, you know, I think it's important to understand what the Graban stands for. But I appreciate it's a very difficult concept or topic to discuss. And I think another important point to make is that the Graban should only be worn by somebody who is responsible enough to wear it as well. So that's something that is relevant to the discussion. But as I say, in terms of teaching about the Graban, I think there's a big opportunity to talk about a lot of wider issues regarding the framing of violence, for instance, who has the right to commit violence, who gave the state the right to say that it can commit violence in a particular kind of way and that an individual can't protect themselves or their community, for instance, you know, where's all this come from? Where's this framing of what is violence and what isn't violence come from as well? 
and the kind of whole idea of defending those who haven't got a voice, you know, what happens to those people. So there's a whole host of relevant discussions that can come out of the Gabon discussion, I think, beyond the whole thing about, yeah, it's something the Sikhs wear as a symbol. I'm just going to say, before we sort of slightly move on to a slightly different topic, yeah. is there anything else, Justine, that you feel we could do to make our teaching of Sikhi more authentic? So even talking about the 5Ks, I think talking about them... <laughs> Not as symbols. I think symbols just basically reduces things to things people wear because they're part of a group, because they feel they have to. I think understanding the reasons why people might want to support these symbols and the fact that it's also part of a heritage. It isn't just something that you do. The fact that I wear this is because somebody in my family, a number of generations ago, decided to become a Sikh. So all Sikhs came into Sikhi, you know. Somebody in every single Sikh's family will have come into Sikhi as a choice. Yeah, so somebody came into it. So I think presenting religious gear as something that isn't just about following a set of rules, but it can actually mean a lot more than that as well. Yeah. Fabulous. Something that I'm really interested in, particularly, I know that through your work, you've done loads of stuff into this, just you, is that the story of Sikh migration into the UK. Mm. Could you just outline why that is perhaps a really important story to share, perhaps even throughout curriculums? Why is that a really important story to share across our curriculums? It's kind of the story of the history of Britain in the 20th century, really. So if you go back to the colonial period, the fact that Sikhs were represented in the British Indian Army in large numbers because <laughs> because they were the last area in Punjab to be taken over by the East India Company. Sikhs provided a lot of resistance to the British, so they were then framed by the British as a martial race. Large numbers then became in the British Indian Army, and then Sikhs were placed by the British Empire across the empire because they were seen as being martial so they were placed as policemen in Hong Kong, Singapore, Shanghai, Malaysia, Fiji, all over the place. And then they fought for the British in the First World War, not large numbers, maybe a thousand Sikhs. So there's photographs of Sikhs freeing French towns and villages. Anybody from Brighton, if you go to Brighton Pavilion, you'll find photographs in Brighton Pavilion of Sikh soldiers recovering from their fighting on the front. And then you saw at the same time, there was a group of Sikhs called Bartras who basically sold wares to people who couldn't get hold of things like nylon stockings or clothing. So they would bring clothing across from the subcontinent and sell it to farmers' wives, for example. So why that's important is because most Sikh communities that are established in port cities in Britain, so Glasgow, Cardiff, Southampton, South Shields, Liverpool, etc., will have their origins in this particular group of people who came across in the 1920s, 30s to start selling wares. So that's the kind of first phase of migration. Then I think it's important to talk about partition and the fact that the partition of India and Pakistan meant that people were displaced in what is now India and Pakistan. Lots of Sikh farmers lost their land, which they had for generations, which meant that they were looking for work. And there was a post-World War II labour shortage at the time as well, which meant a lot of these people came across to Britain to work in factories, work in West Yorkshire, work in the West Midlands to meet this labour shortage and to start working in the NHS and the like as well. So the impact of partition, I think, there on migration, because people often say, why do these people come over, blah, 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 blah. But it's important to understand what historical incidents have taken place that have caused people to have to migrate because they've lost their land, for example. And then the 70s sees Africanization taking place in East Africa. So Uganda gets freedom, Kenya and the like. And there's lots of Sikhs, again, who've been taken over to East Africa in the early 1900s by the British to build a railway from one end of Africa to another. So again, all these links to empire are really, really important. So then they come across to Britain in the 1970s because they've been expelled from East Africa. So you get another wave of East African Sikh migrants to parts of Britain, like Leicester, London and Leeds, for instance. And they're kind of more experienced in establishing institutions and the like. And then the most recent phase of migration has been from Afghan Sikhs. So I've actually dealt with a number of cases of, of Afghan Sikh refugees, and they've started coming across in the mid-1990s as a consequence of the Taliban taking Afghanistan over. Their lives are very difficult. There was actually a case at Tilbury Docks where they found a container full of Afghan refugees, and they were all Sikh. But the interesting thing about Afghan refugees is that unlike other Sikhs, they don't speak Punjabi, so they speak Pashtu and Dari. So the idea that all Sikhs are the same and all Sikhs speak Punjabi is obviously incorrect as well. So the reason I've kind of got a quick kind of overview of Sikh migration is that you can see how different Sikh communities have established themselves in different parts of the country for different reasons. So the whole kind of homogenizing of the Sikh communities being one thing, I think is something that it doesn't do anybody any favors. And also in terms of generations, the people who came in the 1920s will now be on their fifth generation, whereas the Afghan Sikhs will probably be on their second generation, for instance, you know, and the East African Sikhs as well. So 
Lots of this is really relevant to engagement with the Punjabi language, which obviously then impacts on relations, you know, with India as well. So it problematizes this whole idea that all Sikhs are from India, for example. And it problematizes all the idea that all Sikhs speak Punjabi as well. And it problematizes the idea that all Sikhs are basically, you know, second or third generations because a lot of them have been a lot, lot longer than that. So, <laughs> but the point is, I think it's really important because it tells a story about empire. It tells a story about British history, which shouldn't just sit in RE because it isn't just RE, is it? That's about the story of Britain. And I think it's important for, again, everyone to understand why particular communities are in particular places at particular times. And I think it's so significant to be reminded of that Britain is the country we are because of migration. Mm. That you have, you know, a lot of you came to our rescue when we needed help, when we needed to rebuild our country. And that many communities came to flee awful situations to seek refuge. That then we've had this wonderful relationship between migrants to support them and for them to support us. And that every migrant has their own story and not to make sweeping statements about migrants because there's not just one statement that would refer to everybody. And I think this is almost what started this conversation was seeing that we're not recognising the contributions of different ethnic groups and different religious groups within British history and British culture. And that's so important for all areas of the mm. curriculum to recognise the contribution that people have made to British history and British culture. And I wonder if, from your point of view, what do you think is the contribution that Sikhi has made to British culture that often maybe goes overlooked? Oh, OK. Well, that's a, <laughs> that's a good one. Well, I think in the way in which, and I suppose this goes back to the media reporting part of it, in the fact that Sikhs are always, and you see this every time there's an issue. So even with the flooding, I think, that was in Somerset and Hebden Bridge, you know, you see Sikhs coming out and helping their community all the time. And the good thing is it's kind of pretty much become expected now, which is, I think is the way that Sikhs would want it to be. Now, it's a kind of double-edged sword here because I say, you know, Sikhs shouldn't keep having to prove themselves. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Look, look how good we are. Therefore, please let us stay. But it is good that they, <laughs> that they, are using the teachings of the gurus to inspire themselves and showing that it isn't just about Sikhs helping Sikhs, it's about, you know, the community you live in and contributing to the community you live in as well. So I think that's become pretty much normalised that Sikhs will help people where they can. And I've been stopped, I've talked to people who, because of this positive work, have recognised who Sikhs are. And I think what's interesting also is that so older generations may have even fought with Sikhs in the wars or be aware of Sikhs. And that's also an interesting change in the fact that Sikhs were allowed to wear turbans to fight for the British army or the British forces, but then have received racism as a consequence of wearing the turban since then. So interesting how that's all changed. So this kind of this memory as you say, Louisa, of what Sikhs have done, I think it's really important to maintain that, definitely. No, thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks a lot for that. And like, before we wrap up, a bit of an opportunity for you to freestyle a little <laughs> bit here, just Jeet. So any kind of final thoughts that, that, you've, that you've got for us that, that you think are really important would be really nice. So yeah, I think the important thing to say, and I'm quite privileged in that I research Sikhs quite a lot. I'm happy for my research to kind of feed into RE stuff if that's possible. Because I think the issue is that it shouldn't be something that's static. The world is changing all the time. And to be stuck in a representation of Sikhs from the 1970s or 80s, I've got loads of Bari textbooks because I look at them because I'm interested in seeing representations. And as I say, this static representation of religion doesn't do anybody any favours because it's not the way the world is. And kids know that. Students know that. Students see stuff going on on social media. They see stuff going on. I would say, you know, obviously I would say this, but, you know, use people like me more because I have to and I do keep up to date with what's going on among Sikh circles in the Sikh tradition and some of the issues that the Sikhs are facing. So all the Sikh activism in particular, what makes people engage with this sort of thing? So, yeah, I suppose that would be the takeaway is that try and keep it as real as possible, I think. And I know, obviously, I know, I mean, goodness me, it's been a hell of a year and teachers have a lot on their plate. I completely appreciate that. And obviously, there's only so much people can do within the confines of a syllabus. But I think religion can be made so much more dynamic if we kind of talk about what's actually happening at the time now, rather than just talking about sets of beliefs and practices that were kind of established in the whenever <laughs> when people came and the like, yeah. Well, that has been fantastic, just Jude. Like, you delivered every answer with as much charisma and as enthusiasm as I remember from when I was much younger <laughs> uh, at uni as well. And, you know, it's brought back a lot of memories for me. So it's been great to catch up with you uh, on a personal note. But I've really enjoyed my time with you. And I'm sure, uh, and I won't speak for Louise, I'll let well, Louise um, take yeah. it from here as well. Yeah, I mean, just to echo that, I think any RE teacher listening, by listening to you speak, their teaching is going to be authentic. And that was the whole purpose of this. 
So I want to thank you so much for giving up your time, for speaking so eloquently, so wisely and so authentically. And actually, RE is going to become better because of it. So thank you so much. My name is Louisa Jane Smith. And I'm Ash Kundi. And this has been the RE podcast. <laughs> Can I say one more thing? Sorry. Yes, go Jasjeet. Just to say, I'm on Twitter as well. I'm at Dr. Jasjit Singh. So if anybody does want to reach out or whatever, feel free. Yeah. So at Dr. Jasjit Singh. Yep. Be prepared to have your followers increased. <laughs> no, 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 no. So thank you so much for listening and thank you so much to Jazjeet. <laughs>